So I'm going to start off this discussion and then hand it off to Paula. And then we're going to throw open this conversation to all of you, where I think we're going to get um, some rich discussion. So please get your questions. And they don't have to be questions. They can be comments ready um, as we move into uh, Q&A. So in 2015, over a million migrants and refugees made their way to Europe from places like Afghanistan, Syria, and countries in North Africa. It's hard to imagine how this crisis could get any more difficult. But as an indication for a comparison, in January 2015, and only that month, um, 1,600 refugees and migrants made their way across the Aegean um, from Turkey to Greece. In 2016, in January, we had 52,000 um, refugees and migrants making that same journey. And the sort of most recent data from the um, International Organization on Migration, and it's, it's quite remarkable that this data is, from, um, is updated to the 10th of May already. Um, but we see that there are over 180,000 arrivals um, in various locations, just over 150,000 um, in the Aegean area, and also 1,357 dead or missing who have made that journey. Now, with summer fast approaching, um, these numbers, one can imagine, are only going to get larger. And so after they make that journey across um, these various waterways, they then sort of make their movement up towards Europe, Western Europe. Um, now, the, sort of, the Western Balkans, so um, Serbia, Croatia, um, um, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, they have recently sort of closed their borders to um, migrants. But that's, that's not to say that they aren't still trying to get through. Um, and even in Hungary, which closed their borders quite a long time ago, there are also um, migrants and refugees are getting through those borders and finding their way um, to Western Europe. Now, before the borders were closed, last year, um, at the later end of last year, I went to Serbia to do some observations. And um, just to give you an idea of what one month um, in terms of border crossing in Serbia looks like. So in one month, in Serbia alone, 180,000 migrants and refugees crossed into Serbia. Um, about 55% of the, them were men, 16% um, women. Um, 19% boys and 11% um, girls. Now, a lot of the uh, young people, the children, minors, were accompanied by parents, but quite a few were unaccompanied minors, sort of making their way with either friends or by themselves. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about infrastructure for movement, because that's sort of my main interest here. And so when we talk about infrastructure, there's a traditional infrastructure that we talk about, sort of buses, boats, and trains. And so this is a picture I took about 7.30 in the morning um, at the border crossing between um, Serbia and Croatia of um, refugees and migrants waiting for the train. They've been there waiting all night to take them um, across the border. Um, we also have, when we talk about traditional infrastructure, shelter. So this is also at the border between um, on the Serbia-Croatian border, and here we see you know, shelter tents that are sort of housing um, refugees as they make their way um, up through um, Europe and into Western Europe. Um, but when we also talk about infrastructure, we're talking about information infrastructure. So these are the types of um, um, information um, infrastructures which facilitate movement. So here is a, an analog example of that. This is a, a welcome center for um, refugees in Belgrade. Again, this would be really interesting to find out what it looks like now that they've closed their um, borders to refugees and migrants. Um, but in um, early November, when I was there, um, as you see, there's a sign, refugees welcome to Belgrade. Um, they gave sort of information about the bus schedules to the border, um, the best routes. There was sort of clothing, um, donations going on here, water, that type of a thing. But of course, what really interests me um, and interests us here at Dayton Society is the technological infrastructure, the mediated infrastructure, which is also facilitating movement for refugees and migrants. Um, and, and so in that same park, which I visited, there was free Wi-Fi put up by the, um, the Red Cross. And um, of course, a lot of the refugees and migrants had um, cell phones that they were using. And so this 
the idea of the cell phone or the smartphone um, sort of has captivated, that refugees have, has sort of captivated the imagination of certainly a lot of reporters who have sort of claimed that smartphones are as essential to refugees as you know, food, shelter, and clothing. And this is true to some extent. Um, smartphones are certainly used to, um, by refugees to connect with loved ones, people that they've lost, um, people back at home, and also to um, find safe places to, or to sort of um, coordinate safe places to sleep and transportation. Um, however, the focus on one particular technology, like a cell phone, misses the bigger picture, which is that cell phones, social media, Wi-Fi hotspots, um, mobile phone charging stations, translation websites, um, instant messaging, wire money transfers, and, um, and the like have created a new digital infrastructure for movement, um, which is different than what we've seen in the past. And this ensemble of digital tools and technologies for movement and mobility is something that I've called um, the digital passage. And it's used in many ways to benefit um, migrants. And these are just some of the um, sort of digital tools and technologies that we use daily that is sort of collecting information ab um, about us daily that also refugees are using. However, it's not all positive. And so the same technologies that are used for benefits are also used to exploit um, migrants as well. So human smugglers are using Facebook and other social media, WhatsApp, Viber, to coordinate um, and really exploit and profit from refugees who are vulnerable and isolated and um, really desperate um, to find a safe passage. So the same information and data-driven technologies can be used to control as well. And it's in that context um, that I'll hand it over to Paula to discuss how the intersection of technology and policy can work to control migration and refugee movement. Thank you. So right when it gets depressing, he hands it over to me. <laughs> Because unfortunately, it's not only criminals, but also governments that increasingly exploit these digital infrastructures for purposes of surveillance and control. And Mark and I gave this presentation a couple months ago, and I was like, ah, oh, you know, but Donald Trump will never be the president of the United States of America. Now I'm not so sure anymore, so you all better vote responsibly in November. <laughs> but unfortunately, it's not only Donald Trump who's making these kinds of proposals. So actually, one of the ways in which the EU responded to the massive increase of migrants and refugees at the borders of Europe in the summer of 2015 was to vastly increase the amounts of information that they collected about these migrants. Um, and two EU regulations in particular stuck out in this regard, one being the so-called EUROSER regulation, Drone and Satellite Surveillance of the Mediterranean Sea, and the EURODAC regulation, which concerns biometric data collection at the border. And in what follows, I'm going to discuss each of these regulations in turn. So the EUROSER regulation, which is short for the European Border Surveillance System, was implemented in 2013 in response to a perceived increase in migratory pressures following the Arab Spring. So the goal of the EUROSER regulation is to increase situational awareness of the external sea and land borders of the European Union for the purposes of detecting, preventing and combating illegal immigration and cross-border crime. Um, so, in particular, the EUROSA regulation mandates Frontex, the European Border Surveillance Agency, um, with surveying the external sea borders of the EU in a 24-7 surveillance operation using drones and satellites um, in order to obtain real-time pre-frontier situational pictures that they can then share with individual member states. And each individual member state, as you can see in this picture as well, is supposed to also set up a so-called national coordination center for the exchange of information. Um, what's important to take into consideration here is that this, the scope of this surveillance system is not only limited to the territorial borders of the European Union, but actually extends up until the border of third countries. So in, essentially the entire Mediterranean Sea is surveyed um, by drones and satellites. And what's interesting here, actually, this picture I found in a PowerPoint presentation by one of the private sector companies providing these technologies, which adds an additional layer, I think, to this discussion. Now, what's interesting is that the European Union claims that this same system can also be used to contribute towards saving the lives of migrants, right? Because it would allow the EU to detect boats in distress. But unfortunately, nowhere in the regulation it is stipulated what it, how exactly the EU is supposed to respond to these boats in distress, who is responsible for saving them. So actually, human rights organizations suspect that it's much more likely that the EU is using this technology 
to detect boats in international waters before they reach the European Union so that they can then send them back to the ports of origin. But the information collection doesn't end there but also continues at the border. So according to the so-called Eurodac regulation, all asylum seekers above the age 14 um, are obliged to provide their fingerprints to the authorities of the first country of arrival in the EU. Um, this regulation was originally implemented in the year 2000 and originally its purpose was strictly limited towards the enforcement of the so-called Dublin Convention, which stipulates that migrants are supposed to, asylum seekers are only supposed to apply for asylum in the first country of arrival in the EU. So if you're an asylum seeker, you arrive at, say, Greece, you're supposed to give your fingerprints to the authorities. If you then try to continue your way on to, say, Germany or Sweden, the authorities look you up in the database there. They see that you entered the EU to another country. They are allowed to send you back to that country because you're only supposed to apply for asylum there. Um, however, in the year 2013, the mandate of the Eurodac regulation was expanded to also allow law enforcement um, agencies access to this database, supposedly in response to terrorist concerns. But from the perspective of European data protection law, this is actually highly concerning because you're only supposed to collect and access data um, within like, the limits of certain purposes, necessity, proportionality, which are clearly not fulfilled in this case, particularly because giving access to law enforcement agencies to the fingerprints of migrants further contributes to their stigmatization as well, because it implies that migrants are much more likely to engage in terrorist activities than the general population, which on top isn't even true. And then what's particularly concerning, and this is as of last week, the European Commission um, published a proposal that um, is also supposed to expand the mandate of this regulation that not only the fingerprints but also facial recognition data of all asylum seekers in Europe are supposed to be collected. And this also, if this goes through, it would also lower the minimum age for um, integration in this database from the age 14 to 6. So the EU is suggesting that all fingerprints and facial recognition data of asylum seekers, vulnerable population, should be registered in a central database from six-year-old children onwards. <laughs> So, probably all of you are aware that, for instance, in response to the Snowden revelations, the EU was one of the most outspoken critics of the, of the US surveillance program, always sort of like positioning itself as the one continent that respects fundamental rights, et cetera, et cetera, in contrast to the United States. So I thought it was really interesting then to like look at these regulations which concern the surveillance and information collection of, of refugees and asylum seekers from the perspective of European data protection and privacy rights, um, to sort of like scrutinize how the EU treats some of the most vulnerable population members. So the EU makes this interesting argument that while biometric data collection um, of refugees and asylum seekers clearly falls in the scope of both the right to privacy and data protection within the EU, drone surveillance of the entire Mediterranean Sea actually does not fall in the scope of either because the surveillance of the Mediterranean Sea using drones and satellites does not involve the collection of any personally identifiable information. So the EU argues, look, we're only collecting information about boats, not about the people on those boats, so neither the right to privacy nor the right to data protection is concerned here. But a counter-argument to this could be that even if the EU does not collect any personally identifiable information, which is a prerequisite for the right to data protection to apply, um, the EU clearly does infringe on the private lives of migrants and asylum seekers, so the right to, de the right to private life, at least, should still apply. Um, because uh, the right to private life does not only depend on identifiability, but also reachability, which, and this might be something for the discussion as well, is arguably also a much greater concern in the age of big data than identifiability. But just to walk you through this. So, basically, when it comes to biometric data collection, both the right to data protection and the right to private life apply according to European life. The right to data protection always applies to personally identifiable data. Biometric data is, in effect, information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person, so the right to data protection applies. The right to private life also applies because biometric data collection clearly has an impact on asylum seekers' private life with regards to the choice of where they can apply for asylum, freedom of movement, and, and the aforementioned concern about discrimination. When it comes to drone and satellite surveillance of the, of the Mediterranean Sea, in effect, the right of data protection does not apply here because it does not involve the collection of any personally identifiable information. But the right to private life does apply, in my opinion, because clearly 
um, the drone surveillance affects uh, the ability of asylum seekers to apply for asylum, freedom of movement, but also fundamentally their human dignity and physical integrity. So in this case, anonymity protects against identifiability but not reachability, which, as I mentioned, is arguably a much bigger concern in the age of big data anyway. But what's actually really paradoxically in this case is that it might actually be the refusal of European authorities to collect personally identifiable information which raises a fundamental rights concern here. Because what the EU really should be doing is to assess on these boats individually whether there are any people with international protection claims among them rather than what they're doing right now, classifying the entire boat as illegal migrants and sending them back. And there is a fundamental difference between an asylum seeker and a migrant. Um, so it's important to keep that in mind. So just looking ahead, um, this is from a, a Guardian article in February this year, uh, which describes how the EU has scheduled a meeting with tech companies to try and come up with technological solutions to the crisis. So it's very interesting. So EU member states, in coordination with um, the EU border control agency Frontex, set up a meeting with tech companies and asked them for ways in which they could um, use technology to solve this crisis, solving in this case presumably meaning preventing people from reaching the borders of Europe. So one of the proposals that they made um, is to tempt refugees to download tracking apps on their smartphones by offering helpful information about sea crossings and conditions in different EU countries. So clearly this raises some fundamental questions about the ethical use of information technologies within this space and what kind of fundamental rights implications information collection has about vulnerable populations such as these. Um, and also obviously the involvement, of, the involvement and financial interest of private sector companies in this context. And I hope we can um, talk a little bit more about this paradox that Paula mentioned because it really sort of blows my mind a little bit because, it, of course, in the U.S. context, um, not collecting PII is seen to be protective of, let's say, us, um, our privacy, et cetera. But in this context, not collecting personally ident identifiable information actually works against some of the, um, the rights that Paula discussed. And I think that's just a real interesting way of looking at this issue, again, from this European context, which doesn't always sort of um, square with how we think in the U.S., but of course it has um, major ramifications. Um, I didn't want to leave us with the sense that you know all the sort of technology and data collection. I'll sort of bring us back up, actually. Um, that'll be my job, um, but but not quite because because um, we have some examples of um, corporate interests and also international. Um, multilateral organizations actually directly getting involved in using technologies um, to intervene in the migrant and refugee crisis. And so, of course, we have Mark Zuckerberg, who um, has sort of offered, and um, it'll be interesting to see where this is right now, but offered to um, blanket um, UNHCR, or you know, the refugee agencies, um, camps and shelters with um, free Wi-Fi. Of course, there's a lot of um, detail there that we need to unpack just in terms of, um, but because of course, and I think Surya is here, um, who could tell us all the things that we can learn from um, um, logging onto Wi-Fi um, um, stations, et cetera, um, about the, um, and, and reveal about each other. Um, but again, all, with all of these interventions, I don't want to say they're all um, problematic, but we need to be mindful of the both positive and negative ways um, and the real pitfalls and unintended consequences of any type of intervention um, that involves digital and data-driven technologies in the refugee space. Um, and I'll talk a bit just about a few, and then we'll have time to um, have a discussion. Um, so, you know, we talked a little bit about the problem, problematic aspects of um, the Re UN Refugee Agency's biometric um, program, but also these programs are helpful in sort of making um, the distribution of goods and services and money really more efficient for a lot of refugees. And so here we have a um, coordinated effort between MasterCard and the World Food Program to give to credit cards to beneficiaries and recipients of aid, um, particularly in Lebanon and Jordan. And so, you know, it's just like you'd have a credit card, they have a credit card in their um, um, and they can go use that in, in various designated points of sale. Um, of course, some, a lot of these credit cards come with biometric types of, um, um, I guess, safeguards or, or 
requirements. Um, and actually, our friends at Leiden University, I don't think Yoss is here right now, but they are working with the World Food Program to analyze um, a lot of this data, this credit card. Essentially, the World Food Program is now a credit card company, um, sort of collecting data um, just like a credit card company would on every point of sale and where these, what, what has been purchased, where they purchased it, where they've moved. And so they've been actually to analyze some data. I think the report's going to be released in a month or so that says what products have been purchased, where, um, and that could really help aid workers in terms of you know, filling the shelves with projects, products that um, refugees might need at certain times of the year, et cetera. So it, it could be helpful, um, but there are a lot of caveats to that as well. I'd say the, the biggest, um, and I'll end on this point, one of the biggest pushes I've seen in recent years, in the last four months really, has been um, the use of education technology, ed tech, for the refugee issue. Um, and education technology, like Skype in the classroom, has been used before um, in other refugee sort of camp situations. However, um, there is, is a more, I don't know, um, there is even more of a push on these um, ed tech technologies now. And so TechFugees, which is an organization, and they call themselves the TechFugees, um, which is sort of mushrooming worldwide with different events in um, Melbourne, Belgrade, Berlin, London, um, and also New York. And so I went to the New York event um, a few months ago. And the entire event was about, about 100 to 200 people in a room talking about how to design education technology interventions for refugees in Syria. Um, so this is an example of a, um, or this is a picture I took of the Tech Fuji's, um, um room where, you know, think about you know, groups of 20 different people sitting in circles um, armed with post-it notes with a crepe station sort of sitting in the background for anyone who wanted to um, um, get a bite to eat and um, trying to design technologies and interventions um, and really ponder the life of uh, refugees in the um, Zachary refugee camp in um, Jordan. And I would just say that we really need to be somewhat wary of these quick fixes um, and understand the unique context that refugees um, have in both Europe and even here in America. Um, many are experiencing trauma from conflict and how to design education technologies to deal with that is, is a really hard thing to do. It's hard to develop any ed tech, tech, education technologies that actually work even here in America. Um, so um, let alone designing it for these populations um, overseas and in refugee camps. And of course refugees are the most vulnerable populations really in the world today. And so this is a picture of um, the Zachary refugee camp. And so um, you know, really understanding that context is crucial to any type of um, intervention. And really there's just a higher duty of care when it comes to intervening on behalf of refugees using any types of technologies, particularly data-driven ones. And so with that, we have a, a lot of time actually to have a real conversation about this. So I welcome, again, your questions, thoughts, and comments. Thank you. Thanks. I think we have a mic which is going around the room. With all those tracking devices you mentioned and those systems tracking, is there any clear relation of who or owns that or who has rights over it? Is it the provider, the migrant, and herself? Well, who exactly has uh, full rights over that? So that's the issue. Yeah. I mean, I could talk a little bit about the um, some of the sort of data collection on the, the sort of, I guess, the informal um, structure, and then maybe Paul can talk a little bit about the drone and government data collection. Um, it's interesting. I think, I mean, just like us, the, the different types of digital infrastructure that are facilitate movement, like Google Maps and Facebook and um, WhatsApp, of course, that's you know corporate proprietary um, data. Um, with regard to the sort of corporate um, uh, multilateral organizations, sort of. Um, partnerships like MasterCard and UNHCR. From what I understand, and I asked the folks um, at UNHCR, actually, sorry, the World Food Program who are running this program, that MasterCard 
the technology is collecting the data, but MasterCard doesn't have access to it. Um, the World Food Program does. Um, and they, as I talked about in this Leiden University study, they have um, sort of given some of these data sets to researchers um, you know, with all attempts to anonymize it in order to learn more about it. But that's how that um, ownership of data works. Do you have any? Yeah, sure. I can maybe tell a small anecdote with regards to the Eurodac regulation, which concerns the biometric data collection at the border. So um, the Article 29 Working Party, which is kind of this um, group within the EU that is uh, concerned with um, making sure that data protection is respected, um, they, they issued this study um, whether asylum seekers, before they submit their um, biometric data to the authorities, are adequately informed about the consequences of this data collection. So um, they expressed some concern about the fact that um, asylum seekers, when they provide this information, are not adequately informed as to who has this data, uh, how they can access this data, how they can ask questions about it. But what's a little bizarre maybe about this is, imagine that you're that you just fled a war-torn country in which you were persecuted. You only arrive basically with like a shirt on your back, maybe a small backpack. You're completely exhausted. You arrive at the first country of arrival, and the first thing that the EU does is give you like a sheet of paper, this is what it sounds like at least, with small print trying to explain to you the terms and conditions of you providing this data, right? Clearly this is not a situation where the right to information or self-determination can be adequately respected in, in any case, right? Because the primary concern of these people is obviously to, to get asylum and have the right to remain somewhere where they're safe um, from persecution. So already I think this, this, this changes the, um, the calculation that, that, that usually occurs within like, European data protection. But clearly, like, yes, basically you have to provide the data to the governments. The governments have it in that case. And, and I think one of the... One of the things that is so concerning also from the perspective of human dignity, which is the guiding principle of most European law, both at the European level and at the member state level, in Germany that's the first article of the constitution, right, um, is that essentially the European Union is treating these people um, as mere objects in a way, right? Like why is this um, drone surveillance program so disconcerting? Also because you do not at all take into consideration individual life stories, but you just look at them from above, collect information about them and treat them as you wish, right? So it creates a fundamental dignitarian concern as well. But yes, when it comes to government collection programs, basically you, you cannot really say that these people have the right to their own data in any meaningful sense. I'm curious, um, so you talked a little bit about how a lot of refugees have smartphones and there's a lot of attempts at connecting ed tech um, and in all of this. I'm curious if there have been any like more comprehensive studies as to how many of these refugees are using smartphones versus um, dumb phones, um, what kind of technology they have, if there's differences in, in countries of origin um, and how we might use that kind of information to think about how we should be or should not be using technology as part of the interventions. Um, I can talk about one study that I read. There, there aren't many. But one is from um, Carlene Maitland, actually, at Penn State University, who's led a sort of multi-researcher um, uh, team, an institutional team, in the um, Zatari refugee camp in Jordan. So there's about 80,000 refugees, Syrian refugees there. Um, they've sort of been there for the last three years. Um, and so 80,000, probably half, are children and youth. Um, and they, they are, you know, information scientists, computer scientists. So they kind of went around and not only interviewed um, the, um, the users of these phones, but they actually went around with sort of um, Wi-Fi um, connectivity sort of tools to see um, which um, phones work the best in different areas and such. And um, so just in terms of how you could use that information to create better interventions, they found that the, the most popular um, mobile carrier, I think it's called Zane, um, they dropped um, signal 30% of the time. Um, most of the young children, and I, I don't exactly know what the age range is, but let's just say um, below, I want to say below 12, um, don't own their own smartphones, but they usually borrow them. Um, so they have access, but not directly. And, um, you know, and I asked Carlene just 
yesterday. Um, you know, how, how could we devise meaningful tech, ed tech interventions in, in, in Zachary refugee camp? And she was saying that, um, you know, what, what is really needed is that interpersonal connection. Um, and, and a Brookings study actually came out with this as well. I mean, there's a lot of benefits to technology. We use technology every day. We learn, we use Wikipedia, all these types of learning um, technology. It's great. Um, but again, for this population, uh, and, and she said that just face-to-face -face interpersonal interaction in men, one of the many community centers, which are um, in and around the camp, would be far more beneficial in terms of learning for children and youth than you know, a, a young person sitting alone with a smartphone app that's teaching them how to code or something. Um, and so th th those are some studies, and those are real studies which could be helpful, but more are certainly needed. And just to add to that, um, you know, it's very interesting because I think a couple of weeks ago we had a couple of data bytes here as well, right, where um, that we're also concerned with like the use of data in education and um, whenever you try to do an initiative in a country such as the United States or also in Germany, right, if you want to introduce any kind of um, device or new data collection technique within a school, obviously you face immense resistance from the parents, and rightly so, right, because you have a concern about the kinds of ways in which the data about your child will be used. Um, and I think one of the things we need to be we need to remain mindful about is that refugees and vulnerable populations cannot be exploited as sort of like test beds for new technologies as well. Like, oh, I have this great new app and I guess nobody will complain in the refugee camps, I'm just going to try it out on them, right? So I think there's somewhat a tendency, even well-intentioned, right, to say like, oh, I have this great idea, I'm just going to like give it to the people and, you know, they'll be grateful for whatever they can get. We need to be careful about that because a lot of the technologies that Mark also talked about, it's unclear to what extent um, their security infrastructure is adequate. You know, again, these people are fleeing persecution. There are a lot of, like, actors who would be very interested in gaining access to this information. Um, these are still human beings who um, should enjoy the same kind of, like, rights and, and considerations that we also have um, within our more, like, privileged contexts as well. And I think just in terms of app development specifically, when you have, um, I mean, the, the, the regular business model to sustain apps, which is you know, advertising or data collection and selling that data, it's just, it's arguably unethical in a refugee context. Um, and then, you know, there are competitions. So the State Department has a $1.7 million competition um, in conjunction with, um, so it's the U.S. State Department, in conjunction with the government of Australia, the government of Norway, the NGO called World Vision, and Orange for a smartphone app for education technology for Syrian refugees. Um, Again, sort of the um, the idea that there the the sort of app solution or there's an app for that or the appification of everyday life, I think needs to be sort of interrogated a little bit more deeply. Um, it certainly will get a, a lot of attention and sort of bring in different actors that might not be um, um, you know, sort of as interested as before in refugee issues, and that's a good thing. You know, it's great to get the tech for community tech for good community involved in this. That's good. Um, but I think, um, you know, when the $1.7 million has sort of been spent a year later and um, the Tech for Good community has moved on to the next issue, um, the, the young people who had been the sort of test bed for these apps and, and using them, experimenting, they're left without an app that someone is maintaining and developing and creating, you know, fixes for bugs and that type of thing. And so um, another thing that we have to think about, sustainability and you know, where to really prioritize putting um, money in this issue. And also the perspective from which we do it, right? Because I think there's a tendency, you know, it's great when you have, like, meetups here in New York City, you know, and you have, like, really smart young people coming together and trying to come up with solutions to the crisis, right? But um, I think ideally you would also want to work together with the people for whom you're trying to design the app because otherwise there's something a little um, patronizing as well about us like sitting comfortable in our living rooms here um, in a very, you know, in a great city uh, trying to come up trying to like throw apps basically at other people without taking into consideration what they actually want and need, right? So 
I just want to speak to the point you were just talking to about uh, the kind of patronizing attitude in terms of some of these solutions. Um, recently, I was uh, introduced to a lot of uh, VR, virtual reality work, around the refugee crisis. And what was really striking to me was how the gaze was never from the perspective of the refugees or their lives. It was always someone looking in at them. It kind of reminded me of a weirdly like oriental or colonial past where there was this kind of tendency to look into the lives of people in a way that you could step away very easily. And to me, it seemed very problematic, but I wonder if you have um, seen a better side of it or maybe there's a more positive impact that these projects have been doing. Because to me, it just feels like something capitalizing on a marketable trending kind of topical space, which feels exploitative. So I'm just trying to work that out. Has anyone here seen one of the virtual reality sort of, um, you know, put yourself in one of the refugee camps type of thing? Raise your hand if you have. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, does anyone want to answer that here? Sort of a answer that. Like, it, 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 is there a way? Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, yeah, my name is Sam Gregory, and I work for a human rights group called Witness that works on video and human rights issues. And the reason I raised my hand is there was a conference last weekend at MIT talking about this first wave of VR and kind of the sense with a lot of the 360 capture VR, which is what you're describing, where you're kind of placed in the middle of something. It's very objectifying. Um, it's essentially being a spectator and that some of the early VR um, has perpetuated that. And in fact, even from a filmmaking perspective has perpetuated some of the things that, frankly, the documentary community has been trying to escape for 30 years. Um, so it was a topic of discussion. I think people are trying to grapple with it. It's a real problem with that 360 VR because it's essentially just a recorded image. Um, so all the representation issues that come up um, are there. What people are looking at is CG created VR, which is volumetric where you capture a scene and you can interact with it. That is also for some people equally problematic. There's a particular VR that puts someone inside a bombing in Syria to try and give you a sense of that. Um, depending how you understand that, it's a very visceral experience that might be equally objectifying, but it's just starting to be a topic of conversation because I think some people are seeing that in the, that community. Um, but it's true that most people in those communities haven't seen that material and perhaps might react very strongly to the sense of being observed in that way. That's fascinating on a, on a number of different levels. And one is sort of, listen, it, it's, it's, we want to tell the story to people who are in New York. You know, who, who are not going to make it to Jordan or, or Syria or even in, in Europe. Um, at the same time, and it's really you know fascinating um, what Sam just mentioned, which is you know there's something within the very technology itself which can escape the sort of um, representation objectification type of um, 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 I guess problems. And so, um, does anyone else want to speak to this point specifically? Yes. Um, there's a sort of a new initiative nascent uh, outside of Silicon Valley. Um, the people-centered internet is what they're calling it right now. Vint Cerf is one of the founders. And, um, and they have these three principles, and one of them is no digital colonialism. And so I think that there are efforts, and they've, you know, they've gotten some truck with World Bank and this Global Connect thing that's the Washington thing, um, that... Uh, it revolves around this, but they have a pretty strong voice on that digital colonialism. Whether, you know, as a principle is one thing, but how you do it on the ground, obviously, is another thing. Okay. Um, did you have a, a question? Or? Oh. oh, over there. Yeah. We have time, by the way. Oh, well, something, something that I think would be really interesting in VR is uh, if we actually flipped it and thought not about us um, getting an inside view into a refugee camp, mm. but if it was provided to them as a way of understanding what life might be like wherever they're going. Um, and I don't know if anyone's working on that, but that I think would be interesting. Um, something that um, is not VR, but I think is also speaks to perspective is uh, my organization, we run a, a citizen journalism platform in Afghanistan. And one of the things that we've been looking at is having, um, connecting with, with citizens and their families, both that are already in Europe and that are 
are that are in Afghanistan and, and staying behind and having them tell their own stories while they're on the journey. And I think that that's a way potentially of of uh, of showing the story and and um, giving them some agency and some control and doing it in a more dignified manner. What was your org, by the way? Your organization? Um, we're called Impassion, and Citizen Journalism Platform is called I Want to Die. Cool. Persian, uh, we should talk after. Um, <laughs> I, have a, I have another question. Um, you, you mentioned that like using apps and, and the usual monetization method of apps is to sell ads to people. And this is exactly what Facebook and WhatsApp do, is how to say pay for them. So if Facebook is one of the main ways that refugees keep track of each other and their family and, and find new information, which um, I, is good, but also Facebook is using all of the data they're using to sell ads to them. Like, what types of ads do they sell, and, and like, what is that sort of um, space? And is there sort of like this? I know there's a second market for life jackets in the coast of Turkey right now. It's like, what is the life jacket of the digital life jacket essentially based on the refugee economy? Um, thanks for the research idea. Um, <laughs> Um, and I think that would be absolutely fascinating to look at. And it's kind of kind of goes to what we were just talking about, like how to get, it, you know, how, how to um, sort of realize the perspective of what, what is the other actually, and um, and see things from their perspective. And um, you know, for all I know, the ads are important to to refugees. For for all I know, um, you know, I have an instinct and um, to say it's not, but I mean. Um, but 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 that's but that's a that's a that's a really important question. Um, do you have anything? Yeah, no, I mean, I would be fascinated to to look on this screen of a smartphone of a Syrian refugee and see what pops up in terms of the advertising. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's unclear. Like, um, it, it would be interesting to talk to representatives from Facebook as well, like whether they are trying to somewhat cater towards these communities as well. And I mean, I imagine this must raise some really difficult. Um, ethical questions as well, right? Um, uh, my intuition is that probably at this stage, um, social media platforms um, such as Facebook, you know, like and with Mark Zuckerberg also having this proclaimed at least philanthropic agenda. Um, uh, <laughs> I hear some laughter in the audience, justifiably so. Uh, but you know, like I mean, I I I would think that maybe. In this uh, niche of their business, they're probably considering it as part of their corporate social responsibility. But it would be interesting to see as well. Looking ahead, I could easily imagine that um, the kind of like exchanges or like access to information that they have with regards to refugees, once governments come in the picture and also ask, you know, like we want to access this data towards this extremely beneficial purpose, but which might be really nefarious in the end, you know? It, it might be interesting to see how then, like, um, companies deal with these requests. It, it, yeah, so it's unclear. But, you know, the, the amount of data which could be collected on refugees and migrants using Facebook and other sort of corporate platforms and networks it is, it could be absolutely incredible. Um, and it could be... Um, collected, harvested, and used for beneficial um, um, outcomes. I think what, what would worry me a little bit is that um, you know, Facebook would have to really be looking for um, indications of who is a refugee and not. And that's probably not really hard to do. Um, but then it's sort of, you know, there's all this talk now how Facebook might be manipulating different social outcomes. Is it just a platform that people are just sort of communicating on, or should Facebook take a lead in, um, you know, directing politics or directing, um, you know, pro-social outcomes even? And there was a time actually when Google um, got involved in when people were searching for um, um, terms which might have indicated um, suicide, sort of. Um, um, types of behavior, uh, an ad would come up saying, you know, here's a suicide prevention hotline and all that kind of stuff. Um, a, a positive sort of um, outcome. Um, you know, how to do that in a really delicate way, in an ethical way, it, using, you know, even WhatsApp or Facebook or um, Google Maps, or I think is a really hard question that, um, 
you know, more and more tech companies need to really grapple with. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure when Facebook started, they weren't thinking that it was going to be used as a primary platform for communication for refugees. Um, but now that that's the case, you know, what, what can be done about it? And what can be done about it in a way which does protect um, various privacy concerns and human digni dignity concerns, I think is, a, is probably the most important question that social media companies will face today. And it's not their revenue, it's that. You know? So um, hopefully there'll be a lot more of that. But isn't the data collected in Europe protected by the European Data Privacy Directive, ironically? Right, but national security, as you know, trumps <laughs> everything. <laughs> so um, obviously the, the European Data Protection Supervisor and a variety of other organizations have criticized the kind of information collection practices in place, but especially in light of um, the recent wave of terrorist attacks across Western Europe, um, none of which, of course, had anything to do with refugees, there's always like the immediate reaction, like you have the Paris attacks, what was the reaction by the French government closed the borders? You know, so there's clearly like a, a cognitive sort of dissonance between the problem and the, the, the kind of like solution. And I think the, the situation is such that um, it's unclear how much public support, say, like a, a lawsuit would have um, on behalf of asylum seekers or even from asylum seekers criticizing some of these information collection practices. So. Yeah, my only other comment is we could actually easily simulate what a Syrian would see in, you know, Macedonia because we can change our geo and language and simulate what, it, what they would see on their phone. Yeah. Paul, Paul, let me just ask you something. Um, and then we'll go to Madeline. And it's, I mean, you, here's the thing. So European policy is, um, is created by officials. <laughs> And um, those officials, some of those officials at some point are elected by the population and that type of thing. So what is it, and you've been to Europe recently, um, you spent um, the summer over there, you're going back over the summer. Um, what is the climate in Europe? And I know you can't speak for all of Europe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, in, in, if you want to talk about Germany specifically, feel, feel, please feel free. But what is the climate? Um, um, around refugees and migrants now, just from your perspective, and how is that playing into some of these um, policy and political directives around um, data and um, these sort of digital borders that we're seeing and these digital controls? Yeah, I mean, I think there are several um, aspects to this question. First of all, even to most Europeans, the European Union and the kind of policy making it engages in remains a very obscure <laughs> Kafkaesque sort of organization. So a lot of times, um, for instance, the, the proposal by the European Commission that was published last week towards expanding the mandate of the biometric data collection program, I imagine that the vast majority of Europeans isn't even aware of that, you know, because it sort of gets lost in the manifold press releases of the European Union. Um, and there's often times also this widely criticized democratic deficit in the EU, like the European Commission... The governance structure is a little complicated in the supranational uh, realm. Um, when it comes to the, to the public mood right now, and there might be some European members in the audience actually that might have some more sort of like up-to-date impression about this, I can only say that, um, for instance, I was back home in Germany over winter break, mm -hmm. and I'm from the northwest of Germany. I actually live very close. My family lives very close to Cologne. And as you know, like over New Year's Eve, there was this... Um, sexual assault incident in Cologne, which, among others, also implicated several asylum seekers. So within Germany, at least, I think that was um, a turning point. It was obviously like the media coverage of this particular incident um, and the public response uh, m might not be like might not have been like the most like appropriate or, or rational in this context, um, particularly because suddenly all the one million asylum seekers were demonized based on this incident, also underplaying the amount of sexual assault that takes place from Germans to Germans and other Europeans, etc. But clearly, I think this, this was um, a moment where fears, again, were blown out of proportion, even in Germany, which was orig originally a lot more welcoming towards refugees than most other European countries, I'd say. But I don't know if there's anybody in the audience who wants to comment on the mood. <laughs> Actually, I was in. Um, is this on? Hello. 
Hi. Yeah, actually, I was um, I was in Paris on November the 13th. In fact, I was in the 11th around the corner from uh, one of the attacks. And I was also um, in London and Paris a few days after the Brussels attacks earlier this year. And, um, and interestingly enough, it's kind of evenly split between the people that say, you know, we just can't let this stop us from having our freedoms and our rights. I think that's the stronger message. But then what they do, a lot of things what people do is very fearful. And you really see it in what the government reactions are, both in London and in Paris, um, that they're all talking about different politicians who have different ideas about, um, you know, shutting things down and, and everything, you know, Cameron with his back door into every commercial application so that everything can be collected, data can be collected, and then the government can have access to it. So I think the Europeans that I know, and I go quite frequently, are really more like, we have to fight back, we can't have our freedoms, but the actual fear of, well, I actually know somebody that was killed, you know, that kind of thing. It's just this teetering back and forth. Do you want to talk about that specifically? Yeah. Um, thank you. It's just to, to add on your point, um, I don't think in France, none of the big part, probably the 90% of the members of the parliament have not raised any concern about the urgency state, which is still in effect right now, eight or nine months after the attacks. Um, and it's been postponed again and again. And although some people on the, I would say activists outside of the, um, of the parliament are talking about it, I don't see that as a, really as a broad concern or as a topic of discussion more broadly in the society. And um, the urgency state in itself does not grant the state more powers to collect data, but it has been paired with other laws to collect more data. And I think that the concerns about privacy compared to three years ago after the Snowden revelations, for instance, are definitely not something that is in the air, at least, of, the, of most of the political parties uh, in France right now. No, I think you're making a really important point, um, and one that merits further attention, because it's particularly taking into consideration the, the French situation, where really the French government has basically institutionalized um, unreasonable searches and seizures, if you look at it from an American Fourth Amendment perspective, with um, the police raiding apartments at night, you know, destroying property, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's, there's a wonderful article by, uh, well, wonderful, very concerning article by Didier Fassin. Uh, a couple of weeks back, he published it in the London Review of Books precisely about the implications of this law. What's interesting, I think, is that um, for now, I think it, it enjoys very widespread support amongst the general population, both on the left and right, which I think is very interesting, very concerning. But also, I think, one of the reasons why that is so is that the vast majority of the population is not affected by this law so far, right? Because clearly the police is targeting a very, a very specific subgroup of the population, mostly the Muslim population within the country, right? Which does not, however, mean that, you know, like in France, this law is supposed to be, I don't know if they already passed this, but it's supposed to become part of the general government, the emergency law, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but I think that that generally we, we we should be wary. Also, for instance, like the, the expansion of the Eurodac biometric data collection program, it says in the European Commission proposal that collecting facial recognition about asylum seekers is also supposed to serve as a precursor for the wider introduction of facial recognition technologies for the general population as well. Right. So, like, oftentimes, I think um, situations of uh, societal insecurity also exploited to try out invasive sort of like police and law enforcement practices on a vulnerable subgroup of the population to then also expand it to the general population in future. The EU for sure is like on the way towards creating the largest biometric database in the world, you know, so um, it's important to keep in mind that um, 
there are wider implications as well um, for all of us at some point. Well, actually, if this is a related question to that, my, my, I kind of go off in a slightly different direction. OK. Um, so you know, big picture, boiled down really simply, seems like you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't um, in terms of data collection here. Um, and, I'm, and I know, Mark, you've spent some time thinking about different ways in which to sort of evaluate risks and benefits um, in different contexts. Um, and so I guess my question would be if you've kind of had any further thought or sort of development around the idea of like, how do you begin to evaluate um, di differences uh, in terms of like, what risks are you willing to bear in certain instances as opposed to others? And how are you going about making those judgments? or thinking about how to advise people on those judgments. Thanks for the very hard question. <laughs> um, I, think, I think it is, first of all, um, an important step to realize that there are, there are trade-offs. And there are positive and, ne and negative consequences for um, any type of introduction of technology in this um, in this area, and also um, there are real concerns. I mean, there are real concerns to human security and public safety that um, uh, surveillance technologies do address. Um, you know, at the same time, <laughs> or on the other hand, or you know, um, however lawyers talk about it, um, there are there there are other types of risks um, to again the, the the rights that these refugees and migrants actually have under. Um, many different conventions and treaties and such. And so um, how to balance that, I think, is the great challenge. Um, and yeah, I think just having that initial conversation and then maybe you know, twisting the perspective just a little bit. You know, how, do these, how might these technologies be used not just to empower governments and um, law enforcement? And by the way, there's a lot of law enforcement who um, are you know, tasked with helping refugees. You know? um, and you know, trying to stop exploiters of refugees, um, but there's a way to sort of, you know, how do these, might these technologies not only empower them, but at the same time empower the same people that they're trying to, um, um, you know, protect. And I think with with those slight sort of perception changes, I think it, again, a, a first step in trying to um, weigh that balance a little bit better. And I think um, adding to that, I think we should also not. Um underestimate how fragmented, fragmented and chaotic this space is in a way as well, right? I mean, think about all the kinds of borders you cross if you want to make it from, uh, I don't know, from like Greece to Germany, say, and um, think about all the different points at which information is collect being collected about you by different actors, right? I I'm pretty convinced that even within the EU, you know, which is supposed to be this, 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 unified policy space, nobody really has any overview of where the data is going at any given point. You know, you log into one Wi-Fi network and another, so it's a completely chaotic space as well. So um, it might be that even if you, as an individual, say, Wi-Fi provider, provide really good, well-thought-through policies with regards to information collection and, and sharing, it might just be that you get caught up in this very complicated web in which there is no unified framework yet, which is really what would be needed, like a uniform ethical framework towards information collection, right? Because otherwise you're, being, you're going to be undermined at like another point, I guess, in time. And, and also just to, I mean, just to tr try to understand what it's like at the, the border of Macedonia, the former Yugoslav um, Republic of Macedonia. Um, at, at w when I was there in, um, October, November, there was 10,000 people crossing the border daily. You know, I think Macedonia has a population of 2 million. Um, it, it, the, the, the sort of, the massive overload of not only people, but, um, but you know, information. Imagine like a border guard or a station there trying to count or try to collect information. It's, um, it's, it's really difficult. And then after the border, you know, th um, these people who, again, are, you know, it probably took them one or two weeks to get from Iraq or um, 
Afghanistan to get to that border. Now they have to find a ride, you know, to the next border. Um, you know, maybe that's a sort of government-issued bus where they started doing in some places, but, uh, you know, maybe it's a kind of a smuggler or a taxi or this or that. And, you know, think of an unaccompanied minor trying to find a ride across the border to the next to the next border. I mean, it's, it, it's a very precarious situation. And again, sort of that balance between, um, you know, public safety and, and that, but also um, to really um, handle this, th this population with, with the utmost care, I think is, is really at the crux of the matter. And thinking about privacy going the other way, so these people are escaping like a scary, dangerous regime, and what I know ISIS has been known to kind of hack Facebook groups of community organizers in refugee camps, et cetera. Um, what kind of like privacy and security measures are taken that way? Do you know about that at all? Yeah, I mean, I think this, this, this is an excellent point. Um, and again, it, it raises this, this, this interesting question with regards to encryption as well, right? So there are all these different kinds of actors that we have to keep in mind when, when designing a certain platform, et cetera. You know, I think, I think ideally we would find ways in which you know, vulnerable populations, but also the general population at large could communicate securely precisely to, um, so that you can prevent um, nefarious actors on one way, one side or the other, essentially, from like accessing this data. But precisely, obviously, in the context of, of people fleeing private or public actor persecution, you know, and, and oftentimes the, 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 kind, the, the asylum seekers that are being thrown into this melange with terrorist concerns, etc., are fleeing from the exact same people that people in Europe and in the US are concerned about, right? So, um, no, I think you're making a really good point that, that obviously, uh, there are a variety of actors um, from which these communication channels need to be protected. And, and, um, and particularly with Syrians sort of escaping Syria, there's the, um, I've certainly read about, and uh, this needs more research, but um, um, it sort of the, it, the, there's a suspicion around why they left. Were they enemies of the state, of the Syrian state? And so that, that type of, and if there was ever a chance of um, going back, it could sort of stigmatize them in a whole other way. So it's not just sort of European governments or collecting, you know, it, it's other types of ways that um, that information might be used to identify them in, in, in a poor light or unfair light. This might be the last question. So as these refugee migrant communities start to get settled, have you come across any incidents of media being produced by these communities for these communities that take advantage of a lot of these same networks that we're talking about for data collection as ways of spreading both information but also sharing the stories of themselves? So one, one initiative I think that's, that's worth mentioning um, was actually created at um, the University of Oxford by a PhD student there, I think. Um, and I think it's called the Journal of Interrupted Studies. And basically, it's a, it's a journal in which um, only refugee academics can publish their work. So it allows them to somehow co continue, you know, doing the work that they did before. And I mean, these are also like, people with jobs, including academic jobs, um, uh, within like a space. I, I assume the journal is primarily online as well, to like, exchange information not only about the crisis, but it's because in the end you're also like a normal person with a life and a job previously, you know, and ideally you wouldn't be preoccupied, obviously it's like a difficult situation, but ideally you also want to feel that you're doing something meaningful with your life. So I think this is something that, that provides for an opportunity for, for asylum seekers to, to do meaningful things while they wait for work authorizations within like certain countries. Because oftentimes I think once, once you make it to Europe, especially now that the administrative state is so completely overwhelmed with just processing applications, et cetera, et cetera, um, oftentimes you just have nothing to do, you know? And, and being reduced to this existence of like th this stamp of like being a refugee or asylum seeker with no other meaningful purpose at that point, you know, it, it, it's really, I think, that also like very dehumanizing and, and demoralizing. So um, like providing these kinds of opportunities for, for activities, sharing space and stories, I think that's really important. So that's one of the initiatives that I'm aware of. And I think we're going to see a lot more initiatives like that because you're going to have a lot of, or we're already seeing a lot of um, 
you know, the, the, tech, the, the tech community, in particular in Berlin and other places, um, sort of working with the refugee communities that are there, I think we're going to see a lot more um, positive sort of uses of media, uses of technology, um, data-driven technologies, um, which are sort of not only empowering um, migrants and refugees, but also um, helping them to sort of live their lives. Um, and so on that positive note, thank you for that. Um, we'll conclude. Thank you very much for um, coming. And um, we'll be around for a couple of minutes uh, if you want to talk. Thank you.